Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to all of you from all the corners of the world. This is the first online English Dharma talk in my life. So please excuse the slight technical difficulties that you may experience or I will experience. First of all, about the nature of this talk. This will not be the usual talk that you are used to because we are not actually present. We see each other, but we are only at the same time not at the same place. So those who I know, I remember how you were two weeks ago, a month ago, or six months ago when, when we met. But you're not actually here, which I would love. But you cannot be because of the current situation in this world. Most people focus on the virus itself, how it spreads, how many people are infected, how many recovered, how the system copes with this whole situation in each country. But there's a second disease, a second epidemic. The second epidemic is the human reaction to this whole situation all over the globe. And the second epidemic is something we can do something about because it's up to us how we react to this. Our school, our tradition, by Zen Master Sung San, has one and only one question. How may I help? But you can see very different reactions all over the world with fear, with anger, with aggression, with greed, and lots and lots of ignorant views that in turn generate all the others that I have mentioned. So in these times, it's supremely important that we are responsible for ourselves, for our families, for our societies. And the plural is intentional. If you are responsible for your own family, you have to keep that clear, how to be in a good quarantine situation instead of a bad quarantine situation. You have already taken care of other families. You have already helped some other people. And if you help your own country in your own ways, in your own capacity, then you have already helped other countries. The opposite is actually very simple. The opposite is, I don't care. I have my food. I have my drink. I have my security. And uh, the rest is not important. Maybe my family is important. But being quarantined with my own family for one week, with my own resentment included, that's not fun. So whether you like it or not, the entire world is on a retreat now. In the temple, you may ask, how are you, Sunim? Well, we are fine. Nobody got the virus. The function of the community is better than before. We are putting new floor. On, into the office building on both sides, the tea room and the office as well. If you remember, the old floor is pretty much banged up by bad floor heating. And the function is the same. The schedule is the same. The garden is the same. The horses, they are the same. Human beings, they are not the same. Because suddenly, they got it. The world is not the way I want it. The world doesn't satisfy my desires. It's very detrimental if I give way to my anger because I'm locked up with my beloved in the same home. And if I don't moderate, if I don't kind of tone down my karma, in one minute I can drop a bomb which will make the whole atmosphere bad for hours or days. One word, one action, one reaction. So this dualistic mind, this reactive consciousness that we have, that we are so proud of, it now comes out in full color. If you're a peaceful person, your home is also at peace. If you're an impulsive person, your home has a lot of energy, something that you cannot give out. If someone has a tendency to get angry, then the whole family suffers and that anger comes back in a very, very short radius. If somebody has a lot of desire or even greed, that also hits the wall because you can't satisfy it. Not again and again and again. 
Yeah, you can go shopping. Most countries can go shopping. We can too. Between 9 a.m. and 12 a.m., only people aged over 65, they can do shopping. I was kicked out of a shop because I thought it's only for food stuff. So I went into a convenience store, but they kicked me out very kindly. I said, okay, no problem. Thank you very much. And I returned in the afternoon. But some people are not so easy about it. Nyodo san, he's here from uh, Delaware slash New Jersey. And uh, I was there a month ago. And upon my departure, uh, we went, of course, shopping with my host. And uh, we bought some athlete shirts for me. But before me and after me in the line to the cash desk, there were three people. And all the three were holding these interesting small cardboard boxes in their hands, and they were very silent. And I looked at them and the boxes, and the inscription said, nine millimeter Luger. That's bullets, my friend. And we were in a hunting store, I realized, because that's where these quality athlete shirts came from. And my host, Kate, she was very curious and says, well, they're buying it for hobby maybe or hunting. I said, no, 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 no. Virus time, nobody goes hunting. No, no, no. So I, uh, I was ready to go with my own assumptions. And she said, no, I will ask. I said, okay. So she turns to the guy right after us in the line and asks, sir, are you buying this uh, for hobby or for hunting? And the guy says straight into her eyes, no, ma'am, for self-defense. So that's how on March 17th in New Jersey, in a store, just like anyone in a big plaza, they were getting ready for the onset of the virus. And I hope nobody will have to use them, those lugers, those bullets. So how do you prepare? What's your bullet? Is it in a barrel? Is it in your heart? Is it in your intellect? How do you handle the virus? Did you think about actually getting infected? Inadvertently. You just shook hands with someone and you just noticed. And when you noticed, you touched your head. Oh, my gosh, what happened? Or this 1.5 meters of security distance was actually not enough. Or you touched a surface which was touched by, a, by an infected person one hour before, and it was metal, and you didn't know, and you got it. It can happen. If we are attached to our own ideas, we all go to hell. In fact, we are already there. So the crazy people who get really crazy about this, and they're super worried, anxious, irritated, angry, they have very strong attachments. Sung Zansunim was asked a long time ago, Sir, what is crazy? He said, completely attached, completely crazy. Little bit attached, little crazy. Not attached at all, not crazy at all. Okay? It's that simple. Now, keeping our direction clear in these times is really supremely important. Our values, they don't change. Our situation, that changes. Our relationships, they don't have to change. Maybe I can't go to my neighbor. I can't go to the synagogue or I can't go to church. But I don't have to change my relationship to those whom I cannot see. And how do I function? And that's where we come back to the original question. How do we really help this world? If you're not a healthcare professional, you are not involved in the first degree crisis or epidemic. So the first degree epidemic is the virus, as you've heard. The second degree is the human reaction to it in body and mind and speech. We are all involved in that. So let's use this critical time to look into ourselves because there's very little else we can do. We can feed ourselves and our families. We can read a lot of books or watch a lot of television. And most of you are over that. You may have done all that already. So this is retreat time. This is natural introspection time. And the greatest value in any community or any family for that 
is what we call approved silence. And if you have kids, it's very difficult. I know that. But you can ask them, yeah, I can see the smile on many of your faces. I know, I know. I've been to most of your homes. Or you have been here with your kids, and that is wonderful. But if you're always stressed out by talking or in talking back, you lose energy. You lose clarity. Even the best mind can get clouded. So what I'm suggesting is approved silence. Those times, let's say between 7 a.m. and 8 a.m., when we have some silence between us. And we know it lasts an hour, it lasts half an hour, it lasts three times half an hour a day, but unless someone knocks at the door or there's an explosion outside, nobody breaks that silence. And then you can have some quality time with your beloved outside of the usual forms of entertainment. As little as it sounds, I think it's huge. Here in the temple, it's, like I said, business as usual, and we don't talk much. We do our jobs. We don't even discuss the situation. Most people here haven't really heard Three days ago, when I saw that the worldwide infected numbers passed 1 million. Now we have over 1,200,000. And soon these numbers will lose their meaning if we don't do something inside. And that action is become clear. These times increasingly become clear. See the situation without any illusions, aversions, hopes, and fears. See it clearly as it is now. This is the time. If you have been practicing so far, you have a very good chance not to subscribe to any delusions. If you're starting practicing, or you're just at the four hall of Zen or any kind of spirituality, is the time to ask meaningful and real questions inside. Why? The situation doesn't tolerate any BS. You cannot masquerade it. It's real in the sense that we cannot go about our own games in life. We have to let go of our self-image, our illusions about the world, about our ideas and theories. This is the time to get real. And you can achieve that by looking in, by asking the right question, saying your mantras in the approved silence time when nobody bothers you and you don't bother anybody. So use this time for quality mind. Quality mind is clear mind. And you can rearrange your family culture, your family arrangements in such a way that this would become possible. You may feel constrained. No, you're not constrained. If you feel bored, constrained, limited, you're not using your time and your situation correctly. This is the best practice. Bad situation, good situation. Sung San Sunim students all remember that. Now this is bad situation. So for us, inside and only inside, it's a good situation. Not outside. We feel total compassion to those who are directly infected, involved, or helping out with healthcare, supplies, etc., or arranging the world to a better shape so that we don't crash economically, don't have political chaos, on all kinds of social disturbances. Why? Because we actually don't know how long this will last. Most of us hope for a few months. So this don't know is cutting our ideas of the future. Take it as a return to the moment, not as a disability or uncertainty, Take it as a chance that you cannot foretell, foresee the future. So come back to this moment because actually you cannot do anything else. So whether by force or by intent, you have to be here and now with people in your home. Or you're alone and you're spending online time. You're realizing that no matter how much you type and see and watch and hear, you're not together with those on screen. You are connected but you're not together, okay? Please, this is question time for all of you. My question will be about the practice of mantra and meditation. So uh, we know that uh, Sung San Sunim reached his enlightenment by chanting mantra for a long time. So my question will be, is it uh, really enough to maybe go for chanting mantra and less meditation or it should be both? So 
is it depending on mental condition of person? Well, if people have a lot of thinking, then bows are the best. And if you bow together with the mantra, then it's very powerful. If people cannot bow, you can walk and use the mantra during walking time. And if your mind is relatively okay, then you just want to make that situation deeper and that condition a little bit more prevalent and lasting. And during sitting, you can also use the mantra. So the main message here is whether you are walking, sitting, standing, bowing, or even lying down, the mantra can be there. Most important, keep the mantra in your Tantian. If you keep your mantra in your Tantian, then it's not messing with the upper centers. It's not interfering with your thinking, with your speech, nothing at all. Okay? You're welcome. Other questions? So, the question was, what is the meaning of the whole world is a single flower? This was a sentence by Mangong Sunim, Sung San Sunim's grand teacher. And uh, when the Japanese colonial period ended in Korea in 1946, he grabbed a Mugung Hua, which is the national flower of Korea, and he put it into ink and made a huge calligraphy on rice paper, Se Ge Il Hua. The whole world is a single flower. Now, that can have many meanings. And Wangong Sunim is no longer here, unfortunately, to ask, Sir, what did you mean when you just made this wonderful calligraphy? This single flower is our world. Uh, where are you on this flower? Are you the petal? Are you the stalk? Are you the root? Are you the leaf? Or are you this little bee that just gets in and tries to get the raw material for honey, the pollen, okay? So, where are you on this flower? So, this whole with a single flower is a fantastic symbol. We have several copy calligraphies of this. And one day, you can see it for yourself, either here in the temple or in Israel. Next question. Uh, how to overcome never being satisfied with one's actions? Well, if you're not satisfied with your own actions, maybe someone else is. And if there's no one else in that action, that means you have done that for yourself. And primarily, when we do things for ourselves, we are never satisfied after a while. So we are extremely connected human beings. We are social beings, networked beings as humans. So make sure that your action involves another being, at least that dog. And if you keep that dog well and feed it and walk the dog and take care of the dog and take it to the vet, etc., then this dog is very happy with your actions, very satisfied. Maybe you can try that with another human or humans, that you do something for them, understand their minds, understand what they actually need, not what you want, what they need. And then soon, some satisfaction and happiness may appear. So, hi Hanan. Since many of us don't have jobs at the moment and our usual schedule, we don't have a certain time when we have to get up or go to sleep at all. I find that the lack of regular schedule makes it more difficult to keep things clear, to practice, and a lot of karma takes over me. What can I do in this kind of situation to not have my karma and habits control me so much? Excellent question, Hanan. And if you don't have a schedule, make one. The schedule starts with the title, Daily Schedule for Hanan, from Kwan Sam Bostal herself. Then, get up this time, practice this time, breakfast this time, meditation time, free time, lunch time, meditation time, mantra time, dinner time, sleep time. You make the schedule, then you have what we call coronavirus solo retreat. Sad Busyutka, my question is, why there is so much anger against elderly people? Well, I ask you a different question. 
Why do some Indian people in the Hindustani Peninsula throw stones at doctors who are treating patients with the virus? Same question, because we know that elderly people, like anyone over 65, they are more prone to the infection. So those people who have very limited minds, they presume that if somebody is elderly, then they are more, more likely to have the virus. And if they have an infection, they can infect them, those who always want to save their own lives first. Okay? So that's why there is anger in these limited minds. See, Abaji, how can I use a disease, throat inflammation or sore throat, for spiritual development? Well, Abaji, that's a very good question. And the answer is mantra practice. Not loud because you have sore throat. But you can chant it within your own heart. And remember that mantra practice cleanses your whole being, including your throat chakra. So then your sore throat will go away if you take a lot of medication, including vitamin C and honey and ginseng and ginger, etc. But mantra is number one. Okay? Next. Nyodo-san, what do you recommend for a mantra? Well, uh, in these situations, the short answer is Kwan Seon Bosal, or in Nyodo-san's tradition, Kan Seon Bosatsu. And you're lucky because Hakuin Zenji has a fantastic mantra, which more or less goes like this, you know, Kan Seon Namu Butsu O Butsu U Inyo Butsu U En Buppo Son En Jo Raku Ga Jo Chon En Kan Seon Bon En Kan Seon Ren En Ju Shin Ki Ren En Fu Ri Shin. And then again, Kan Seon Namu, etc. This is very powerful. I've had the chance to recite this when um, Shodo Haradaroshi was here 11 years ago in Hungary. And I have a fantastic memory of this. If you're in the Japanese tradition, of course, I don't know most of those mantras, but I know this one. And a lot of similarities exist between the Japanese collection and the Korean collection of mantras. Very similar toolbox. So this is fantastic. Because compassion is the way through this. If you don't generate some compassion, if this situation lasts too long, human beings will begin to do incredible things to each other that we never thought we could do to each other. So compassion is the only thing that keeps us sane, keeps us on the right path. And of course, wisdom is necessary. But if wisdom gets too much thinking, then compassion goes down. How do you know that your wisdom is not correct? Because it starts to miss compassion. It starts to be really selfish. It starts to be just cold, calculated thinking. All right? That means only theories, no wisdom. Only me. Only I think for myself. And others, they're not important. So, Kwan Seon Bo Sal, short. And if you know, uh, if you know the great Dharani, the great compassion or Nila Kanta Dharani, I recommend that for beginners, use YouTube, use Wikipedia, and Nila Kanta Dharani with that TH and the DH, look it up, it's fantastic. You can also download from our homepage, zentemple.eu, to cut the search short. And uh, I really recommend that you spend a lot of time with this, because then this connection, this heart-to-heart -heart connection to those human beings that you don't even see, but we depend on each other, it will flourish. It will be there. All right, we have a couple of questions coming in. Tatiana, what about chanting Shurangama Mantra? Do you think this one is also very powerful now? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So if you're familiar with the Shurangama right now, or if you get into it, you can. You can. It's a whole collection of all the Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, deities. So we this is the entire lineup. It doesn't get any more complete than that. It's such a roster, nobody is missing. Everybody who is important up there, they are in that mantra. You can do that. But this is the Pratyangiram Dharani. And the Great Compassion Mantra is the Nila Kanta Dharani. 
both are important. So promise me if you do one Shurangama, do three Nilakanta Dharanis after that, okay? One to three ratio, necessary, thank you. Betty, how can I find the balance between my job, which I have just started, and my family time, my husband and daughter? I feel I do not have enough energy for both at the moment. Again, this is a similar answer uh, to that of Hanan's. Betty, you need a schedule so that your family is not always all over yourself and then you are not always sharing these momentary times between your job and your family. So make a schedule, then you have quality time focused to one and the other. Why? Have you noticed that our mind quality depends on our mind focus and clarity? Or you are with someone and uh, the actual interaction depends on the attention that we pay to each other, not really the amount of talking or food or TV that we watch. So how do we pay attention to each other? So if you're 100% doing your job and then you're 100% paying attention to your family, that's correct. 50-50, not correct. Bouncing between the two every five minutes or five seconds, not correct. It slices you up. Drives you nuts. So 100% do your job, then 100% be with the family. Hi Miri, how do you explain the coronavirus spreading all over the world in terms of karma? Miri, I don't know. I don't know. If I knew, I would be there fighting it. I only read the internet. And the internet sometimes is reliable, sometimes not. So the most plausible explanation that it spread from wildlife like bats and these uh, whatever was being sold on the Wuhan market to humans. And that's it. I don't deal with the biology anymore because I'm not a doctor or a biologist or a virologist of sorts. But what we do to nature, that comes back to us. We are killing nature. So nature a little bit tests us. Oh, this is not the big deal. Not yet. So nature is coming back to us with this very intelligent but impersonal reaction, okay? If nature was a person or persons, human beings would have been wiped out long time ago. We are such a parasite on earth. So we got back a little bit of our own karma, which we did to mother nature, and we just keep doing it, who knows how long, that uh, she can fight back. We treat wildlife like this. Look at the pictures that are available and the stories. If just half of that is true, we are pretty much up the creek without a paddle because the way we treat nature is terrible. So this is a very small payback yet, very small. Next, how to explain to others the importance of don't know mind? Look at them in silence like this. then they have no idea. And the moment you stop the ideas, you can substitute the Zen hit. You cannot always sit the floor, especially, you know, maybe you're not a Zen teacher. And if you use a stick like this, they think that you're threatening them. Don't. Don't do that, okay? Bring some silence to the narrative. Cut off their thinking. For that, you have to cut your own thinking especially if the situation gets too heated, if there's an argument. Argument is always back and forth, the ping pong of anger or arrogance or greed. That's argument, all right? So what you need to do is stop the ping pong, stop the action, reaction, action, reaction. And then silence comes, presence comes. You don't cut the connection. You're looking straight at them but not in a combative manner. It's not a confrontation. It's a correlation. You relate to each other without provoking or continuing the conflict. And this direct perception without any reaction is the scariest thing of all. They just can't figure what's going on. And then don't know comes. Maybe some clarity with the don't know as well. Okay, that's what you should shoot for. 
And choose your time very carefully. You can't do this every five minutes. Next. Hi, Cosmo. I'm practicing for about a year and don't feel any change. The only thing I feel is that if I don't meditate and miss a day, it's a painful feeling, really physical, like I have a spring in my belly that needs to unwind. What change should I feel? How can I know I'm doing it right? Cosmo, I have good news for you. You're doing it right. Because you feel the need. You feel that you're missing something if you're not doing it. That's plenty. You should know that this whole Zen practice, if you are following our tradition, it's not clear from the message and it's all right. Our tradition doesn't build you a new self-image. It even takes away the one you already have. No more illusions. It takes away the ideas that you currently have. You don't have to feel any specific change. Just you look at the sky and wow, it's really blue. And you see someone and you find that there's no particular projections of desire or anger to that person. So you have a fair chance that you actually see that person as he or she is. You don't have to feel anything special. In fact, if something special happens, if we, and particularly if it persists or repeats, something's wrong. Okay? So don't uh, worry about anything that comes or goes. Keep up the practice. If you keep practicing, then there's effect. You don't have to feel anything special. Next. Hi, Christine. Hello. Are you able to send or post the name of the mantras you mention? Also, do you feel it's a very reaction-based time, as you said earlier? I'm thankful for Zen practice. Well, wishes to everyone. Well, I, I'm not clear about this sentence. Do you feel it's a very reaction-based time? Well, what I've tried to say is that we are really closely tied and bound to each other in this quarantine situation. So reactions can come and go very easily because we are forced to be together. But the time doesn't have to be based on reaction. We usually do that inadvertently, uncontrollably, but it doesn't have to be like that. So later on in the chat section, before this whole thing is over, I'll post the names of these mantras, rest assured. How do you keep clear mind moment to moment from Shtarid? Um What do you see now? What do you hear now? What can you smell right now? Especially what can you smell? Why? If you have a sense of smell, you're not infected. The first real scenario with the virus is that your sense of smell is gone. Then other symptoms may appear. So moment to moment, see clearly, hear clearly, think, feel, taste, touch, etc. clearly, no projections, no ideas, no mental processes overlaying the direct perception. And if you can do that, you can stay clear. And when you think, just think. Okay? No secondary layer on thinking or tertiary, etc. There are some depictions of Kwan Sam Bosal with 16 heads on top of one another. 16! So I asked, why? Because we have so many layers of thought, so many layers of I, so many kinds of karma, that each one needs compassion. So this multi-layered nature of karma and the address, the relationship to that with compassion, that's symbolized by the 16-headed Kuan Sambosa. Next, hi ST, what is the best way to help con concerned people who are afraid in these days? Well, ST, the main question is whether these concerned or fearful people, they are in the same household as you are, because you can have a direct effect on them, they can have a dire direct effect on you. And uh, the treatment is very different compared to the online relationship that you call them or you can see them over some video chat. But basically, the real question in both cases is where does your fear come from? And work on that. What are you actually afraid of? Are you afraid because you have some 
uh, illusions, projections. You're thinking about death. You're thinking about your friend's death, your dog's death. What are you actually afraid of? That you run out of toilet paper or wine or baklava? So what are you afraid of? Just keep that question very, very clear. And uh, sometimes the best way is to acknowledge that, yes, they said something legitimate. Then you are afraid together with them. Yes, I'm afraid of that too. Now, you're not afraid alone. You're afraid together. It changes a lot of things. The other division line is, is this something you know or you don't know? If you know, you can have other tactics than fear. You can have conscious aversion. You can have some kind of tactics that you can use because you already know the object of fear. But if there's something you don't know, then why worry? Why worry about something you don't know? Try to get to know it, then fear may disappear or at least reduce. So don't run away from fear. Don't be afraid of fear. Don't fight fear. Be afraid together. It's okay. Make sure you are a little bit less afraid than the other person. And then when you have shared that feeling, you can start to gather your center and ask good questions. Then get out of it together. Hi Nancy, will you please comment on the statement, mind is bombarded by the constant static of human certainty? Well, thank you, Nancy. Uh, Let's see where this uh, sentence comes from. Mind is bombarded by the constant static of human certainty. Uh, I don't think certainty would be so bad if it was real certainty. But if it's a bombardment, not a clear one-pointed message, then it doesn't really seem so certain. It's human ideas of self-reassurance. It's human ideas of certainty that is actually not there. Now, that bombardment doesn't need any surface. It doesn't need any reaction or response. What it needs is you staying out of its way. Now, let's presume that you cannot get out of the way physically. That's where the dance begins. That's when you have to do the Tai Chi of being present without any forceful reaction. And then, this bombardment stops after a while because you are present, but there is no surface of self from which the whole thing could bounce back. No one can hit empty space. No one can fight somebody who doesn't fight. So understand the nature of our true self. Clear like space, clear like a mirror. Okay? And that's how this bombardment will stop. Take the energy out of it by not reacting to it and take the information out of it by not making any identification or judgment out of it. And then soon it stops and then there's a little gap in the bombardment and you can send in the message, can I help you? No white flags, you're not surrendering. You didn't fight, why surrender? Just keep it clear non-fighting. If you don't fight, it doesn't mean that you lost. You can only, only lose if you fight and things turn out bad for you. You didn't start the fight, so you cannot lose. The bombardment will stop because you're not reacting to it and you're opening other channels to distribute the attention. If you try that, it will work. Hi Miri, what's the best way to cope with the anxiety regarding my financial situation? Well, I really wouldn't think in terms of bank figures or bank accounts. I would think in terms of food, drink, medicine. And that's something you guys can share. You guys can share even by keeping the rules. If we are attached to the figures, then people can go totally berserk. Like the Hungarian currency, the good old forint, lost 20% of its value in the last four months. 
Now, if we were concerned about that, we would go through the roof. And we are, but not from the financial side. We are from the mental side. What kind of mind is it that generates that? That's the question. So, we have to think in terms of real values. And the numbers will bounce back. Because this situation will be over after a while. It will, it will not last forever. And if you can survive the anxiety and you can provide for yourself and your beloved and your friends, then you survived. And then the numbers will bounce back. That's the nature of the beast. Let me tell you a story, okay? This is from like 2003, Malaysia. And by then, if you recall the foreign exchange manipulations of the 1990s, late 1990s, some Western individuals and uh, corporate actors wanted to break the back of South Korea, Thailand, and Malaysia. Those economies were going up very fast, very strong. They were the small tigers of Southeast Asia. So they started the currency manipulation in such a way that it would prompt an inflation, a big domestic devaluation of such currencies in their own countries. And it worked. In uh, Korea, I was there. They had IMF soup because, of course, IMF was the great helper. And the IMF soup was, for those who understand Korean culture, ramyeon for 1,000 won in 1999. And uh, the whole country was not really broken. The Korean won lost some of its value, but the economy bounced back. Thailand took a direct hit. It was not so well protected. Malaysia, and that's where the 2003 story comes in, remarkably survived with very little turbulence. And I happened to meet the finance minister of those times, four years later. He was sitting in the same car and we were going up to Genting Highlands for a Buddhist function and I asked him what had happened and he said, listen, we knew that this was illusory. We knew that it didn't reflect the actual value of our economy. So we shut down the stock exchange, the foreign exchange markets for nine days and when the cloud passed, we reopened. And it's my addition that poor Indonesia, they didn't do that. And the price of raw rice just went up 14-fold, okay? That's 1,400% in three months. There, people died in the streets in Indonesia, neighboring Indonesia. So how do you survive? Don't follow illusions. That's how you survive. Money is convention and value and tradition together, okay? We don't go into that now. But you have to understand that it's created. It's something that doesn't exist outside of the human mind. I and mean, can you eat a $1 note? No, you cannot eat that. Can you drink a 100 shako note? No, you cannot drink that. You can drink water and you can eat bread. So make sure that you have that. And of course, for that you need money but it's not primarily what we need. Money is a means of exchanging material value. But other than that, it has no value. So make sure that you have real value and that's us, that's human beings, okay? If you have good friends, they can help. If you are in a position to help other friends, do that. And then the financial situation will bounce back. Karen, how can we help single people who don't practice, but the loneliness is very strong? Well, Karen, it's a general question. We would have to see those lonely people one by one, what kind of mindset they have. Because look, nobody's entirely lonely. Everyone has a mother, a father, maybe ex-family members who are no longer there children who have just left the nest. So let's find those connections. And you, if you find those connections, you have a fair chance. But people who are not in their private circles, they may not have so much access. Of course, if you have access to them, you can set up regular meetings, you can call, they can call you, but they have to understand that the sky 
the space, the air is already with them. They need human company, we understand that. But they're not entirely lonely, all right? They always have something, someone with them. Even the most outstanding Taoist hermit has a little butterfly, you know? Or an ant. Or just the rocks. Or this mold on the side of the cave, okay? So we are never lonely because we exist in the world. We breathe air, we use sunshine, we drink water, we eat food. We are not lonely. Even in space you are not lonely. Suppose you get on the first spaceship to Mars and you take a spacewalk. You're still connected by this wire to the spaceship and you see all the stars. You're not lonely. So let's make them realize that they are actually not lonely. They want something that they cannot have right now. It's another human being in the same place. Nurit, hi. We observe that politicians use the situation in a corrupted way. What can we do in terms of individuals and as a society? Good question, Nurit. And the answer is Huaum Song Jung, the protective deity mantra, okay? And for those who want to know this, because I can see the flare up of the eyes on these small screens on my computer display, it will be posted too. So, can you fight? Yes, you can. Can you win? No, you cannot. Maybe if millions of people were in the streets and you were one of them, together you could win. I don't see that. Nowhere. Everybody wants to make sure that their own situation is secure, that they have their own money, their own food, their own families, their own work, their own. And this goes on until a certain threshold of pain is reached. 1956 Hungary was a very good example, okay? Everybody believed in communism for the first 10 years because after the devastation of World War II, it really built up the country. Huge advancements, huge restorations, but the laws got tighter and tighter, the elite got higher and higher, people got poorer and poorer, and by 1956, it was the second year of famine in Hungary. Famine. People had very little to eat, or in some areas, nothing. Now, Hungary has very good land, lots of water, good agricultural tradition. What was the problem? The system was the problem. The administration, the dictatorship, all those communists, they were the problem. So, 1956, people felt they have nothing to lose. They went to the street, and they did what they did. Okay? This was a remarkable, glorious revolution that was crushed. But it happened because it had to happen. And that was a very slow melt for the following 10, 15 years. Private sector opened, private business opened, etc. How much are you afraid of your own losses? Do you feel you have nothing to lose? If you feel you have nothing to lose, you will go in the street and demonstrate. But as long as you're afraid of your own losses, you will hold back. You will make compromises, okay? So how do you change the system? Because I don't believe in revolutions. I believe in evolution. Revolutions always ended up in the worst possible way. And my best example is the French Revolution. No history classes here, but start with 1789 and finish with 1815. Look at that particular part of European history, and it's a full circle from one emperor to another with tens of millions of people dead in the meantime. What did they achieve under the banners of liberté, égalité, fraternité? What happened? Actually, what happened? That's why I don't believe in revolutions. But I'm just as radical as any revolutionary, but I keep that inside, intentionally. So internal revolution means spiritual evolution. Folks, please understand that. The only way out is in. I didn't say that. A great yogi said that, and I totally concur. So the only way out is in. The only revolution is evolution. The only progress is in the mind. If your mind is clear, if your mind is high quality, 
new ways, new options open. Those that you have never seen before because your mind was just not at that level. And then we can connect differently. Maybe we can change things we thought we could never change. But without the advancement in the mind, without the elevation of our qualities, it will never happen. We will be in the same realm, okay? Exactly in the same realm. Very similar mind quality. Okay? That's why we need to practice. Marthi Barna. How does this present situation affect the temple, the Sangha financially, pragmatically? Do you need help? If so, how can we help? Well, first of all, it does affect us because we are on fumes. We are living on our reserves. But everybody is living on their reserves. Everyone. So if I say we are fine, it's 50%. It's the better 50%. If I say we are not fine because we are living on our reserves, it's the worst 50%. You know why I'm not asking for help right now? We could. We would have all the basis. We have no blood relationships. We are not living with our families, etc. It would be morally, financially, practically and ethically sound. I'm not asking for help right now. Nobody's sick. Nobody's hungry. I'm asking, help those people who are around you and they need help. And then, when this situation is over, come back to the temple. Let's practice together. And then, if you can, make some donations. Not before it's over. We don't take from each other right now. We try to give to each other right now. Those who are really in need. So yeah, everybody is living on their reserves. We do too. Let's share what we can. And let's help each other in ways that uh, are really practical and forward-looking, especially when this is over. The current situation warrants for only one thing. Stay connected, stay clear, stay human. And if there's any material help needed, do that around you. Oh, you can do that remotely too. But the reason I'm not asking for it right now because we are actually not suffering. There are lots of other people who are suffering. Help them. Okay? From iPhone to me. Okay. Is it wise to make compromises? What kind of compromise would that be? That's my question. Could you be a little bit more specific? Mm -hmm. Try that. Hi, Astrid. You're the iPhone. Very good. So, I mean doing things that we don't feel to do, but seem beneficial for the mind. You know, Astrid, you're a hard nut to crack. Because I asked for something specific. There's not, not much specific, okay? What is beneficial for the mind? You mean bowing, chanting, sitting? It's not a compromise. It's business. Buddha's business. Do Buddha's business. Invest. This is the time to invest in the Dharma. It's not a compromise, it's being smart. So, beneficial for the mind. I hope that you meant our practicing and nothing else, okay? Because our practice is the most beneficial for the mind. Other legitimate practices as well, of course. But in terms of benefit for the mind is the Dharma. That's not a compromise, it's priority, okay? Everything else is karma. Karma comes and goes. Karma is heavily dualistic, okay? Dharma, fantastically transcendental. Clear like space, clear like a mirror. Nothing really beats that, okay? Especially now. Tatiana, do you believe when we are chanting or doing practice together, we create more peaceful world, inner becomes outer? Uh, Tatiana, these are actually two questions. One is, do we create a more peaceful world? The answer is, first we do, inside, definitely. I mean, that's one of the great side effects of our practice. But this inside peace has sometimes a hard time radiating outside because we feel it hits some hindrances. So we have to be very practical and patient about it and find the right way of manifesting that. Being peaceful does not mean you become just weak, malleable, 
only adjusting, only following other people, being somehow the product of this world because you stop fighting, okay? I suggest the term peaceful warrior because the warriorship is not violence. In fact, it's the opposite. It's manifesting your power without violence and the greatest power is non-dualistic wisdom, selfless compassion and helping all beings, okay? So by practicing and practicing alone, can we achieve that? The only way to have this internal peace if we put our own mind to rest. We disable our own ego, we don't power it up, we have something else. We have clarity, no I. That's the source of peace, that's the source of oneness, okay? And if we practice, then we also connect to each other. First to those who we are practicing with, then those who are practicing at the same wavelength, okay? And the second question is, as I mentioned briefly, how we manifest that? Now, the manifestation is 10 times more difficult than you think. So, most peaceful is that you don't want to manifest it, but in conflicts, in spontaneously arising situations, you don't fall for the usual dualistic human reactions. You cannot be provoked. You don't follow just karma. You don't follow ideas, all right? So then peace is there without any special manifestation. I saw a study that shows that when large groups of people meditate together, it affects the whole area around them. The amount of crime, depression, etc. goes down. Is this true and can you explain this? Yeah. I mean, I know you are referring to the American study, the transcendental meditation, etc. Yes, it works, but you have to invest a in whole lot of energy into it, okay? And this magical 1%, yeah, but that means hardcore regular practitioners. What I have seen in any kind of group, that it, if it reaches 10%, then it begins to work. It really does. We are mentally connected in ways you cannot really see. I'll just give you an example. So you see this material, material here, okay? This is, this is how much we see. And then you can see another one. And another one. This looks like three little dots, okay? These are the tips of the wave. But originally, it's from one sea. It's from one fabric, the same water. That's how we are as individuals. The, low, the deeper you go into the subconscious, the more connection you find. Subconscious family karma, subconscious social karma, subconscious national karma, and an overall human karma, okay? In psychology, these are the archetypes, so you can refer to that as well. And as we practice, the information goes through the open channels to those people who are connected to us karmically. I could tell you stories how my family reacted to my Zen practice, not really consciously. Conscious reaction first two, three years, but after that. That's very interesting. So we affect other people, but the passive part, those who are just receiving this Dharma energy, they also lose it because they are not conscious practitioners. And for some time, an area can get better in terms of the reduction of crime, uh, disappearance of depression, etc. But how much are they open to that? That's number one. How much are they conscious of that? Number two. And number three, how much are they ready to reproduce it, to become an active member of their own group as a spiritual practitioner? And I don't mean that people should follow the same tradition or they have to be uniform, whatever. No. It means turning energy inside, becoming clear, and then not manifest the usual human karma. And when we do that, we actually help these beings around us, along with all the conditions and all the limitations that I had to mention, because that's a general experience. Hi, Ferenc. Buddha said we need to turn away the senses. Did he watch the world happen like he were watching a movie, Game of Mara, 
Ferenc, please update your knowledge of the Buddha. He didn't say turn away the senses or from the senses. He said transcend the sensual world. It's like taking an aircraft and looking at the earth from an unseen perspective so far. It doesn't say that you shouldn't use your senses or turn away from the senses. Turn the attachment from the sensory data inside and release that attachment. See where that attachment comes from. Stop the identification with the senses. That's for sure. But you have eyes. Use them. See clearly. You have ears. Use them. Hear clearly. Okay? Attached to the senses, you have a problem. You don't use your senses, also have a problem. Remember that. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Welcome. It would seem that in the East, they are dealing better with the virus than in the West. South Korea is doing well. It's just something in the Eastern culture as opposed to the West that helped them. Hanan, uh, you've been to Korea. You can see how group-based it is and they really take care of each other. And the only reason why they stopped because they manufactured their own tests. They started testing hundreds of thousands of people. And then they actually stopped the crisis because they have strong family mind and strong group karma together. The US has a very individualistic culture. They also take care of each other through various ways and means and they use systems. But the reason why it's so infected right now over there, because the administration was not acting in time. And when it started to act, it started it in a, I should say, non-professional way. And I'm being very gentle. The culture and the group karma actually decides how they deal with these crises. And some of those numbers that you can read on the internet, you know that they are not real. You know that it's impossible that so few infections can happen in such a big country. You know, and I don't name those countries. What I want to point out is that every culture has a mind quality, which is how much clarity, compassion and wisdom, and how much anger, greed and ignorance. Along this axis, you can see how well they respond. Hi, Ralu. Coronavirus quarantine and samsara, same or different? Raluka, how may I help you? Excellent question, but the only answer is this. The virus is definitely not nirvana, that's for sure. So we have to do something about it. Hi Moshe, do you see a connection between the Corona's implications and the Heart Sutra's instructions? Of course, Moshe, I can see those implications very well. I'm pretty sure that when those folks in Mahayana Buddhism, they put down the Heart Sutra, they had the virus in mind. Why? Because human beings, we as a group, we actually act like a virus. We are like the worst epidemic on the face of this earth. Eight billion strains of the same virus called human being. And we dare to call ourselves sapiens. Congratulations. The best name for our species entirely. So to cure ourselves from being a disease and actually being a good guest on this earth, the Heart Sutra is really necessary. Because if we identify with what we think and we don't get to the source of the thinking, we become ignorant. If we identify with our own emotions and we don't get to the source of these emotions and we don't take control of our, of our own emotions, we become nuclear bombs to our families, to our partners, to our society. So yes, there's a huge implication there. Do not become the virus. Do not be a parasite on the face of this earth. That's what the Heart Sutra is about. Then your heart can really open. You can wake up and save all beings from suffering. Otherwise, we are just viruses. That's all. Hi, Anat. Until what point do you help other people? When do you say that it's enough? Uh, several factors. For instance, 
Are they really sincerely receiving what you're giving? Do they really take your help? Uh, at some point you can say, well, I've helped you, now you can start helping others because you feel that they are using your autonomy not to manifest theirs. So they have to have their own autonomy while being helped. If any help is used in bad faith, you have the right to withdraw it. So there are limits. How much is enough? Moment to moment, we have to see that very clearly. How much is enough? And if it's enough, then you don't help anymore. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to sincerely thank you for your attention. All these little screens on my big screen. And I hope to see you in two weeks at the same time. And I hope that you keep up the good spirit of being a correct human being. That we are practicing together and we help each other in ways that we may, we may not have thought of before. Uh, I just want to kind of give you an overview how many countries got involved here. Uh, the largest number is Israel. Toda Rabah. Everybody from the United States will know those son, thank you very much. Jerry from South Africa, thank you very much. And lots of Hungarians who speak English, Kasalam Sepana Fidyamat. And of course, Spasiba Balshoya up in Latvia. Tatiana, wonderful job. And if I missed someone, I'm sincerely sorry. I can still see Nancy here. Thank you. I hope you're in Florida. Okay, not in New York. Wonderful. Thank you for the nod. And uh, hope to see you guys again. Keep up the good work. If anything urgent comes, feel free to write or connect. We are not alone. We are doing this together. Okay? Thank you. See you in two weeks. Goodbye.